a long, long time ago. In a village in beautiful southern India, there lived a little boy. He wasn't like the other children who would play and laugh and have games in the village. He would sit quietly by himself with a sweet smile on his face. And inside there was a profound yearning in his heart. This little boy wanted to see the face of God. Late at night, before the family altar, he would sit very still and he would pray to the Lord with a bursting heart. And he would say, Oh Lord, I know you are with me, but I cannot see you. Please, please show your face. One day, the yearning was so strong in his heart and he wandered beyond the village into the fields. He found a pathway that led along the river and deep into the forest. And there he found a large banyan tree with branches hanging low over the water. He crawled up next to the trunk of the tree and sat in a cushion of grass. And he closed his eyes and he petitioned deeply the Lord. Oh Lord, I know you are with me, but my eyes cannot see you. I want to behold your face. Please don't hide from me, Lord. The little boy's heart was bursting. He went on calling to God in this way. And just as he was about to give up, in the darkness behind closed eyes, there was a halo of light. And the halo began to increase and grow. It became brighter. He opened his eyes and the halo was still there. And the light grew and it became very bright. And out of the center of the light, there came the Lord Narayan. And he manifested to the boy and he smiled and showed his face. And there was so much love. The little boy was absorbed in looking at the face of his beloved. And the God remained there for a long time. And the little boy drank deeply of the joyous presence. And then Lord Narayan smiled and he disappeared, leaving the boy in a glow of devotion. The little boy walked home along the river and his heart was full. And in the coming days, he felt the Lord with him and he was happy. And yet, gradually the memory receded and he started to yearn again. And he said, oh Lord, I saw you once, but I want you with me. I want you with me all the time. And then knowing only one thing to do, he found the pathway again along the river back deep into the forest and found that banyan tree and he crawled up into his ocean seat and he sat and he closed his eyes and he prayed deeply. He said, Lord, you have revealed yourself to me once. Come back again. I yearn to see your face. And he meditated very deeply and still with great intention. And then the glowing light came again. He opened his eyes and out of the aura of intense light came the Lord Narayan again. And this time he came very close and his face was sweet and gentle and he smiled on the little boy and the little boy was intoxicated with the Lord's love and the Lord reached out and touched him and blessed him. And then he spoke these words, many years of this incarnation shall pass before you will again behold me in this way. Always strive to hold me close and never let me go. Know that I always love you and that I am ever with you. And then the Lord disappeared and the little boy in the afterglow of devotion, he felt a new strength, a new resolution. He now had direction from the Lord and he knew what he must live. He must always hold the Lord close. And so with faith, the little boy resolved in his heart that he would serve the Lord and keep the Lord with him close to his heart and wait for the ultimate promise to be fulfilled. I have a couple of cosmic questions for you. Did you enter into this life with a yearning not of this world? Have you carried with you a haunting memory of a hidden glory, something which you cannot describe or even understand? 
And have you felt within you a longing to know where these mystical feelings come from? Paramahansa Yogananda says that this is a sleeping memory from a sacred experience that you have had in the astral world before you came into this life. Let's listen to how he describes it. Devotees who in the afterlife, in the astral world, have even a glimpse of the supernal heavens, are blessed thereby with an intense longing to attain the kingdom of God. When such souls reincarnate, they have from birth an innate compelling desire to know God. By prayer and good action and spiritual seeking, their yearning draws them again to where they left off in their relationship with their rightful guru, who stands ever ready to show them the path into the heavenly kingdom. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't it mystical? Is this you? If you feel something now stirring in your heart, then this is you. Let me interpret. Before this life, you were in the beautiful astral universe. And there, while you were there, the glory of even higher realms was opened to you. And as you beheld that great light and that great love and joy flowing through, something awakened in your heart. There was a deep yearning. That is my home. That is where I belong. I want to be there. But it was your time to come back to Earth. And so you passed through the astral portals into the physical world. And you forgot this sacred experience. But a memory remains. And that yearning is still there. And so we have this intense longing for the mystery to be solved. And I think that this week, all of us who are participating in our convocation share this mystical feeling. We all have this. And it explains why nothing in this world is ever able to fully satisfy us. We have set our sights beyond. And we look around us at the world today. There's so much sadness right now, isn't there? So much loss, personal loss. And there's a chaos and a craziness that we can't explain. But it makes us question, why am I here now? We did not come just for this drama, just for this worldly drama. We came for a higher purpose. We have a higher mission to accomplish. Paramahansa Yogananda's lifetime spanned two world wars and a great international economic depression. Right in the middle of it, in 1940, Paramahansa Ji was addressing a group of sincere spiritual seekers in Encinitas, California. And he encouraged the group Rise above this age in which you are born. He said to them, rise above the age in which you are born. When we hasten our evolution through right living and a spiritual technique such as Kriya Yoga, we live ahead of our time and can find freedom in God within this or only a few lifetimes. And he's saying the same to us today. Face life courageously. But this is not the drama you came for. Rise above it. Don't allow the dark dramas of this world to prevent you from striving to attain a higher goal. So now we are celebrating 100 years, a full century since Paramahansa Yogananda launched his mission of spreading Kriya Yoga to the world. And this centennial event is coming at a time when Sri Yukteswar, his guru, says, the world is reaching out for spiritual knowledge. 
and I believe our large gathering this week is proof of this prophecy. But there's a very personal and mystical side to this centennial. It honors you and your spiritual journey, your aspiration for self-realization, and your striving to achieve it. With the help of the Bhagavad Gita scripture and our Guru's mystical commentary, let's take a deeper look into two spiritual forces that are gifted to us by God, divine aspiration and spiritual striving. How can we advance them? How can we keep them alive? And how can we rise above this age in which we are born? I think most of us here now are familiar with the Sanskrit word dharma. Dharma is righteous performance of natural duty. And duty are the actions that are before us, presented by karma and conditions of life, to be fulfilled with noble intention and offered to God in service. So Dharma, we might say, is a code of honor to help the spiritual warrior to perform with honor and nobility on the battlefield of daily life. In the Bhagavad Gita, God talks with Arjuna. Our Guru introduces an even higher code, a higher form of Dharma. And it is especially for us as spiritual aspirants striving for self-realization. This higher code has a Sanskrit name. It's called Svadharma. Sva is the higher self or soul. So this is soul's duty, our supreme mission and purpose to seek oneness with God. Paramahanshaji says, Svadharma, soul's duty, signifies the spiritual duty necessary for the realization of the self. So how do Dharma and Svadharma function together? Well, the street version might look something like this. You have a dream for a family and to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you would like to bring a useful product to market, something that would be useful for society and humankind. Um, you want to earn well and support your family. And you want to do this in a moral and ethical way and dedicate the results to God. This is righteous dharma. Svadharma integrates a path like Kriya Yoga into this life and work. So while you are starting your business and building a family, you are also aspiring towards self-realization. Sva Dharma, soul's duty. It adds a higher dimension and a more profound purpose to life's project. So let's talk about Sva Dharma. And then let's move into a Bhagavad Gita, Gita teaching on how we can apply it. I like to think of Svadharma as having two primary components. One, divine aspiration. This is the awakened desire for God. It's a personal vision or an ideal of the mystical goal of life union with cosmic bliss. And there is also a yearning to achieve this. This is divine aspiration. Spiritual striving is the sacred motivation, we might say, the driving will to perform actions that propel us toward this lofty goal. So aspiration and striving the lofty goal that seems just beyond our reach, and the effort that we are making now to achieve it. Our spiritual life is driven by
by these dual forces. And for the disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda, this is the path of Kriya Yoga. Spiritual striving is a daily experience. For example, a disciple begins each day with meditation. And the disciple aspires to also meditate in the evening. But in the evening, family commitments make this difficult. Every evening, there is the aspiration to meditate. And every evening, there are also duties in the home that must not be neglected. So there is a tension every day between aspiration and striving, between our lofty goal and what we are able to do right now to achieve it. Now, this can feel like a conflict, but it is not a conflict. It is actually a healthy dynamic of svadharma. I would like to highlight this. Imagine yourself, use your imagination, imagine yourself as a rock climber. You are making a mountain ascent, and you are climbing a vertical face of rock. You are sitting in a harness, and you're hooked up to a top rope safety line. Your aspiration is the summit above you. Your striving is the climbing before you. Now, in technical climbing, there is a vital rule. Keep tension on your safety line. An experienced climber leans into her rope, using tension as leverage to maneuver on the face. While climbing, you want to take up the slack to keep the tension, because a loose safety line is a risk. The more slack, the further that you can fall. So the guru has mapped out the route and mans the top rope. Your divine aspiration is the goal above you. The striving is the climb before you. Do not worry about the tension between what you aspire to do and what you are able to do. This is a healthy dynamic of svadharma. It is there to support you. So now you are back home after an exciting mountain climbing adventure. And you have a few days off, and you are thinking about just relaxing. But in the background of your mind, there is this idea that I would love to schedule a longer period for meditation. My guru encourages me to do this. I have time off. I could do this now. You relax one day and enjoy yourself. You relax another day. A third day, you kind of push the relaxation. Um, you're sort of ignoring this um, thought of scheduling a longer meditation. After the fourth day, some laziness starts to kick in. And then you start to feel a pang in your heart. This is the guru. He's tugging on your top rope. He's saying, come on, get back to the climb. We have work to do. <laughs> we need to make the next pitch by nightfall. This is the tension between aspiration and striving. It is there to keep us moving forward, progressing on the path. A little secret of spiritual progress learn to harmoniously coexist with these dual forces. They are there to support you as you climb, as you walk the path. I hope this discussion is connecting with you. I hope it resonates with your experience of spiritual seeking in daily life. I think we have all come to the conclusion now that truth must be put into action before it can become realization. So today, August 11th, is John Mashtami. Salutations to Lord Bhagavan Krishna. We will honor him tonight with a wonderful commemoration here at the Mother Center Chapel virtually, and also in India. So it will be an East-West celebration 
of the birth anniversary of Bhagavan Krishna. And so to honor him now in this presentation, I would like to dive more deeply into his scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. And we can see how to exercise these dual forces, how to keep them alive, how to keep them strong. We are drawing here from the um, passages that are a favorite of Swami Sri Yukteswar. It's chapter 12, stanzas 8 through 11. And our guru introduces the series with these words. From the 8th to the 11th stanzas of this chapter, Krishna reveals various methods of attaining liberation each path suitable to devotees who have attained a certain grade of spirituality. My guru, Sri Yukteswarji, often remarked that the various modes of liberation mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita make its precepts so sweet, sympathetic, and useful in healing the manifold sicknesses of suffering humanity. Personally, I call these verses the levels of spiritual striving because they show us so well how to apply spadharma, how to walk the path of Kriya Yoga while facing the constantly shifting uh, demands of inner and outer challenges of life. We can be floating along in a wonderful um, joy of peace and meditation is smooth and devotion flows sweetly and then suddenly we can be hit by a storm of karma Relationships are difficult, work is hard. Um, there are so many challenges to face and the chaos of the world around us has an influence that we feel. Life seems threatening. And so we need guidance. We need direction. How to keep the vision of our aspiration clear and how to strategically and successfully continue to strive toward it. These are the practical issues that we want to address. So the Bhagavad Gita starts this series of stanzas at the most exalted level of striving and then descends into the painfully familiar. Let me read these verses first and then we will discuss them. So here Krishna is talking to Arjuna. Chapter 12, verse 8. Immerse thy mind in me alone. Concentrate on me, thy di discriminative perception, and beyond doubt, thou shalt dwell immortally with me. Verse 9. O Dhananjaya Arjuna, if thou art not able to keep thy mind wholly on me, then seek to attain me by repeated yoga practice. Verse 10, if again thou art not able to practice continuous yoga, be thou diligent in performing actions in the thought of me, even by engaging in activities on my behalf, thou shalt attain supreme divine success. And then verse 11, if thou art not able even to do this, then remaining attached to me as thy shelter, relinquish the fruits of all actions while continuing to strive for self-mastery. So as we explore these passages together, um, we hear the voice of Krishna in the verses and the voice of our guru in the commentary. Each verse has its own level of striving. The scripture is presenting the highest level, level first, so let's start there. Krishna says, Immerse thy mind in me alone. Concentrate on me thy discriminative perception. And beyond doubt, thou shalt dwell immortally with me. This is the highest calling. This is a state of superconscious inspiration living in a state of divine grace. 
We feel transported by peace and joy. Devotion flows naturally and sweetly. Meditations are deep and profound. Our guru says, in realizing the oneness of soul and spirit, the yogi is then able to feel the blessedness of the infinite being existing not only in the material world, but also in the endlessness beyond vibratory creation. In early years as a monastic, I lived here at the Mother Center, and I was privileged to have uh, the late Brother Anandamoy, a first-generation disciple of our guru. Uh, Brother G was a personal spiritual counselor for me. And during this time, I had a season of very beautiful inspiration. It just kind of descended on me, and it lifted me up above the worries of the world. I felt no cares. I felt this great joy of God. Um, meditations were deep and smooth. Um, devotion was flowing sweetly. And this went on one week, two weeks, three weeks. And I started to think, oh, I've reached my goal. I have self-realization. This is never going to end. And I remember sitting down in council with Brother Anandamoy. And I told Brother, I said, Brother, I, I, think, I think I've reached my goal. And I remember Brother G smiled and laughed gently. And he said, no, no. You are only tasting a little of the Amrit, divine nectar. And then he leaned forward to me and he said, you are drifting. You must work. You must strive. Work and strive. Do not stop. Never stop. Well, the experience faded. And it was then that I understood the work that I needed to do. One must strive and continue to strive to sustain receptivity. Even in a state of grace, there is striving. Striving to sustain and expand the glory of God. And now in private spiritual conversations sometimes, spiritual seekers and disciples will say, oh, I had the most wonderful experience of God. It was so powerful and real. I think I've reached my goal. I have self-realization. Brother Nanamoy is gone, so it's my turn. And I can smile and say, yes, but that has faded. Well, yes, it has faded, brother. So there is yet more work to do. Krishna's verse here is an action statement. Immerse thy mind in me alone. Concentrate on me thy discriminative perception. And then the promise, beyond doubt, thou shalt dwell immortally with me. Guruji does say in the commentary that the initial inspirational states are temporary. And like the little boy in our opening story, we may be blessed to behold for a season, but we are not yet able to sustain it. Guruji gives us a Sanskrit word to define our striving at this level. Abhyasa yoga. Abhyasa yoga the repetitive effort to hold the mind continuously in its pure state of divine attunement. And Guruji says, after meditative unity with spirit is permanently established, the devotee attains the superior state of oneness with God, plus complete escape from the bindings of material vibrations. He enjoys the dual perception of oneness with God and interactions with matter, while his consciousness within remains wholly detached from material vibrations. This is a beautiful description of the path of Kriya Yoga that we seek to walk today. This is our goal that we are striving for, this continuous state, inspired state, close to God. Rise above the age in which we are born. This requires self-mastery, and this is one reason why the devotee is advised not to talk around or casually disclose your inner 
inspirations and revelations of God. This is a personal gift from the divine. It is for you. It is not for all. If we have a lover's secret, just between you and your lover, and you kind of casually talk about it with someone else, isn't that sort of a betrayal? Isn't some of the intimacy lost when the secret is lost? And so intimacy with God is something worth protecting to hold to yourself and to privately cherish. It is said that the doves in Tangiers, coo in Arabic, uskuru rabakam, uskuru rabakam, remember your God. So chapter 12 begins, chapter 12 verse 8 begins the series at very lofty heights. Verse 9 now enters into daily life of walking the path. Krishna says, O Dhananjaya Arjuna, if thou art not able to keep thy mind wholly on me, then seek to attain me by repeated yoga practice. So the previous verse is, strive to sustain me. And this verse is, strive to attain me. Traditionally, most Gita commentators render this verse in terms of devotion. So the striving that is recommended is um, devotion to God. Our Guru's unique contribution defines striving at this level as steadfast scientific yoga practice. Guruji says that if a, de a devotee is unable to remain absorbed in spirit, he should faithfully engage himself in practicing repeatedly the scientific step-by-step -step methods of yoga for soul union. So this level of stri striving is sadhana, the spiritual actions given by the guru when performed daily lead us to liberation. And this sadhana is beautifully outlined in the new Self-Realization Fellowship lessons. Meditation with Kriya Yoga Pranayama and walking the path daily as defined by the guru. If you, your yearning has been for a path that you can walk, guided by someone whom you trust, this may be the path for you, Kriya Yoga. It is a safe path that we can walk together. So steady and regular effort builds spiritual strength. This prepares us to receive cosmic perceptions and it also expands our capacity to sustain them. Paramahansaji says, as defined by the Gita, in serious spiritual endeavor, the blessing and guidance of the Guru are essential. The true disciple follows with great devotion the sadhana given by the Guru. Through this sadhana, his Guru invisibly helps him to attain the successfully, successively higher steps in the art of divine union. In the East, there is a symbol of human consciousness, and it is the lotus. So the lotus plant produces a bloom that grows high out of the water, and it first is in the form of a bud, and the bud is tightly closed, and this is a symbol of uh, human consciousness that is dependent upon the senses. It is unaware of the mystical, glorious goal of life. But then with the awakening of divine aspiration, and with the pursuit of spiritual striving, gradually the petals begin to open. They start to unfurl. And as we strive and as we aspire and with the help of the guru walking the path, then the consciousness can begin to open and fully receive 
the light of God. In this level of striving now, mastery of the restless mind um, becomes the real battle. And as part of this commentary in this series, Guruji uh, includes a surprising personal confession. Our master says that during his youth, he loved to play football in India, and football started to invade his meditations. Let's let him tell the story. He says, Though I was born with the blessed perception of spirit, once in a while during my youth, my mind became very restless when I was engaged in the practice of yoga meditation. During some of these periodic attacks, I would visualize myself as playing football, a game I very much enjoyed and at which I was adept. At first it seemed that my habit of mentally playing football could not be erased. So here we have our guru. Uh, he's playing football, which in India is soccer. And during the day, Guruji is playing soccer with his mates. And then he goes back home and in the evening, late into the night, he is meditating and soccer becomes a temptation in his meditation. The guru is struggling with restless thoughts. But here is the conclusion. He says, nevertheless, I tried persistently to make my meditations longer and more intense, endeavoring to make each day's realizations deeper than the spiritual perceptions of the previous day. In this way, I became accustomed to remaining continuously in soul joy. The formation of this habit led to the experience of ecstatic bliss in omnipresent spirit. The effort to rise above soccer in meditation produced a new level of ecstatic bliss. That's quite a testimony. This is the testimony of an avatar. So your guru also struggled with temptation of restless worldly thoughts, but he responded with a powerful will, an unrelenting determination of spiritual striving to focus more deeply on his pranayam. And according to his testimony, this effort produced a new level of communion with God. So even great souls can have personal experience at this level of striving, as defined by the Bhagavad Gita. Even later in his life, Guruji, living here at the Mother Center, enjoyed sport and had a competitive spirit uh, one of Guruji's uh, first-generation women disciples, Sala Sutamata, the late Sala Sutamata, played amateur women's tennis as a young woman. She gave up the sport uh, and came into the ashram. But the stories are legendary and part of our culture here at the Mother Center that Sala Sutamata played tennis with her guru. So one day I was out on the tennis court down below the International Headquarters building and I was walking there and I saw Sala Sutamata walk down the steps. There was my opportunity. I came over and pranamed and I said, would you mind telling me uh, about your experience playing tennis with our guru? And she said, I would be most delighted. And then she said to me, tennis was a new game for Guruji. And so when we started a match, I went easy on him. So she was doing soft volley. But Guruji played vigorously. He hit the ball hard, forcing me to play at my very best against him. And then I asked her, how did you feel while playing tennis with your guru? She said, oh, it was a joyful experience. Everything Master did, he gave 100%. So these stories can give us a clear message. 
when we are faced with inner or outer challenges, double down on your striving, double down. Increase your willpower, increase your determination, and it can take you to a new level of communion. In private spiritual conversation, disciples sometimes say, Oh, my practice seems so dry. God seems so far away. I don't even know if God is real anymore. And I often respond to them, but you have had some personal experience of God. Oh, no, no, not me, brother. Maybe someone else, but not me. And I will say, no, no. You have been attracted to a mystical path. You have had some personal experience that has brought you here. Maybe it was a dream that inspired you and lift you, lifted you up for days. Maybe you were out in nature and you felt your heart expand and had feelings that were beyond human emotion. Maybe out of desperation you prayed and you needed help and almost like a miracle that help came that showed you beyond all doubt that God was taking care of you. Dig into your archives. Do it now. Find an, an experience that is God's gift to you. And this person will dig and they'll find. And they always find and they say, oh, oh yes, well, there is something. And then I will say, do me the great honor and share with me now. I would love to hear it. They start to describe their exp the situation and what was going on. They describe the experience and how it began to grow within them. And then they start to share the feelings and the inspiration that they are recalling from that experience. And oftentimes tears start to form and they start to cry. They are reliving their experience and it is becoming real. And they say, you are right, brother. God is real. God has blessed me. Gyanamata, a favorite woman disciple of our guru, was giving advice to one of her sister nuns. And she said very, very simply, relive your spiritual experiences. Spiritual inspirations from the past are very different from mortal memories. A superconscious perception is eternal truth. It remains alive. Using your imagination and memory to recollect, we can actually reawaken the inspiration. And as that intuitive cosmic feeling returns, new truths can be revealed. So a little spiritual homework for this week. Dig into your personal archives and come out with just one personal gift from God. Just one. And then take that into a meditation. Perform your meditation series with techniques. Do your pranayama. Sit very quietly at the end of your meditation and then begin the recollection. Put yourself back into the situation in time. Try to reconstruct the feelings that you had your prayers that you offered, and the feelings that started to come. I promise you, you will begin to feel that inspiration again, and much more. Because as you subtract the occasion and the situation, and you concentrate upon the cosmic feeling that was there, it will begin to grow. It will begin to expand. It will produce new inspiration. So verse 8 is, strive to sustain me. Verse 9, strive to attain me. And verse 10 now, strive to serve me. If again thou art not able to practice continuous yoga, be thou diligent in performing actions in the thought of me. Even by engaging in activities on my behalf, thou shalt attain supreme divine success. So even when life is over-challenging us, we do not give up. We put more effort into devotion and service. And Guruji says, we do this while we continue, continue with our efforts in meditation. So here in the 10th verse, life is challenging us, family drama, financial worries, long, long hours at work, 
Meditations may not be at that time rewarding, but we can still deepen our connection with God through offerings of service. Guruji says, by, performing of right, by performance of right actions with faith in the Lord, a devotee will ultimately find through perceptible response from him proof of his unseen presence. So the scriptural teaching here is to, to perform actions as devotional offerings. And this is productive spiritual striving. We are investing more selfless love into the work we do, and in this way, righteous dharma becomes svadharma. And there is a secret here. Even if our meditations are restless and unrewarding, our steadfast efforts in love and service generate devotional energy, which will deepen our meditations and attract the loving support of God. And at the very end of an intense chapter of life, we can still find ourselves coming out ahead. Now this verse addresses an age-old trap which perfectionists fall into. If I can't do it perfectly, why bother? If I can't do it perfectly, why do it at all? Is this familiar to you? Well, listen carefully, because the Bhagavad Gita is advising just the opposite. If you can't do it perfectly, do the best you can. Flex, adapt, but always strive. The skillful, the skillful mountain climber cannot go vertical, so she goes horizontal, always searching for the next ascent. Banat, banat, banjai, making, making, one day, made. Even when life is very demanding, we can still strive forward with our divine aspiration, selfless love and service, combined with short, productive meditations, finding devotional ways to bring God forward, and making Divine Mother a living partner in all of our projects. Strive to sustain me. Strive to attain me. Strive to serve me. And then when Maya and Karma seem to completely overwhelm us, Krishna says, seek shelter in me. This is Svadharma. If thou art not able to do even this, then remaining attached to me as thy shelter, relinquish the fruits of all actions while continuing to strive for self-mastery. The scenarios here are endless and we know them all too well. Overwhelming adversities of life, devastating personal loss, severe health challenges. Life is like a dark tunnel with this tiny white light at the end that never grows any larger. At this level, we can strive to live like the saints, one day at a time. Dedicate each day to God. Let God direct your life. Don't try to be always in control. Let God be in charge. Cling to Divine Mother with faith. Don't let go of your aspirations, even if you are unable to strive. Offer everything to her, Guruji says. If a devotee owing to materialistic tendencies is unable to perform material and meditative actions in the thought of God just to please him, he should cling to the Lord with faith seeking refuge in his unconditional love, and perform all actions without concentrating on their fruits. In time, the devotee will grow in spirituality. His mind and heart will become purified." So once again, our guru is compassionately defining both the aspiration and the striving. And Guruji promises that important purification will bring us into closer attunement with God. Taking shelter and enduring purification is also svadharma. 
I still remember a woman calling me asking for prayers during surgery. She said, brother, I'm having um, a surgery that is very high risk. Uh, it is my only hope. Uh, the doctors are not promising that I will come through the procedure. Could you please pray for me and give some advice? And so we prayed together on the phone and I asked God, what should I offer? And then I said to her, when you are on the gurney, before you go into the operating room and the anesthesiologist is about to administer, relax yourself completely and surrender your life to God and Guru. Completely release. Give all of your life and give everything and renounce completely and feel that it is in God's hands, it is in Guru's hands. She came through the surgery. I visited her in the hospital. I walked into the room and she was radiant. I said, tell me about it. She said, brother, as I was on the gurney, I was offering myself to God and Guru and Master was there. And not only Master, but there were angels. I was surrounded by angels that were blessing me with light. And brother, when I was in my hospital room and I was regaining consciousness, the first thing I was aware of was Master and the angels. They had been watching over me the whole time. And then she asked me, Brother, why is it that when I am helpless and in crisis, I have my greatest experience of God? So striving at this level is taking shelter calling on God, calling on Guru. And it means most of all drawing the Guru close. He is your divine friend. He loves you unconditionally. Let him walk with you. Let him grieve with you. Let him struggle with you. And if you are paralyzed with confusion, don't hide from him but draw him close. And even if you let go of your divine aspirations and temporarily stop your striving, still, if you take refuge in the Guru, he will hold you safely. He will hold you until you can climb again. I would like to close with a personal story with our late president, Sri Dayamata. This was a time when she was enduring great trials as president. And I was in her office waiting while she was working at her desk. And being with her, I was empathically feeling her burdens and I was feeling sad for her. I was feeling sad for her. Why? Why does she have to endure these burdens at such a glorious stage in her um, career, in her life? And Diamata stopped her work and she looked up and she answered my thoughts. And she said, you don't have to worry about me, my dear. Long ago, I resolved nothing will ever come between me and my God. Now, I can share her words with you, but what perhaps is missing is the power of her resolve. When you feel that power at close range, you feel pity for the opposing forces. They do not stand a chance. So Diamata's words from Enter the Quiet Heart. What tremendous love what soothing peace, what intoxicating joy are waiting for you in the calm depths of your being. That is where the divine is to be found. When we call to God from the quiet center of the heart with simple, sincere yearning to know him and feel his love, unfailingly we draw his response. That sweet presence of the divine beloved becomes our supreme reality it brings complete fulfillment. It transforms our lives.
Please close your eyes for just a moment and let me offer a prayer in closing. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and you are Guru Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. O oh, beloved God, you have awakened within me a divine aspiration to realize my true spiritual potential. Ever help me to follow this path and to keep my striving strong. Throughout all conditions of life, O oh, beloved God, with your support and with your blessing, I shall reach the summit of blissful oneness with thee. Om Shanti, Om Shanti. Peace. Amen.